and away we go. Welcome to Second Opinion, the reviews show here on the Nexus. I am your host, Ian R. Buck, and today I will be joined by Brian Mitchell so we can review Mac OS 10.14, Mojave. Find the show notes for this episode at thenexus.tv slash SO52. I, I have to admit, Brian, that I have obnoxiously been referring to it as Mojave occasionally. Uh, oh no, you're the worst. Just to piss people off. <laughs> I guess that's better than Mojave. Yeah. It's, and it's probably worse than people who accidentally call like the iPhone 10 the iPhone X because they just don't know better. Oh, no. I had a conversation at work yesterday and my coworkers were like, no, we're going to call it the X because it's a letter X. Like, <sighs> but it's Roman numeral. C- come on. The weirdest thing is like, I think I was listening to, I think this is Cortex and like CGP Grey has been calling it the iPhone X, but he just got an iPhone 10s and he calls that one the 10s. So I don't know what's going on uh, in his brain. I guess because the the s lines have always been a number before. Sure. I don't know. Yeah. <laughs> it's weird. It's hard. All right, but let's talk about uh this new version of macOS. This is pretty exciting cuz this is the first time on second opinion that we've ever reviewed a like a desktop operating system. Um we've had our annual Android and iOS version reviews, but uh so are we going to review all of macOS and its entirety of its macOS 10 history in Heck one no. episode? No, that oh. would be that, that would be insane. I don't have time for that. Read the John Syracuse reviews, and then after him, who wrote uh, Stephen Hackett wrote some good reviews after John Syracuse has stopped. They're, yeah. they're they're like thirty page reviews. They're like Federico Vitici's iOS reviews, but for macOS. Yeah, yeah, I um. I really enjoy like that sounds kind of similar to the Ars Technica like Android reviews that are, you know, however many thousands of words long. Yep the the yep. macOS ones when John Syracuse wrote them were on ours as well. All right, so the biggest change day to day that I have noticed since upgrading to macOS Mojave is the new dark mode. Yes, if you enable it, you will see everything is inverted. Mm-hmm. but in a better way. Um, I think this is a, an, an interesting thing and it's really handled in a very Apple-y way because the you know the colors are, are dark, obviously, so a dark background with white or light text on top, but it's a lot more than that too. Um, Apple also added new accent colors to the system preferences. Yeah. Before it was graphite or blue, and now there are, I don't know, additional options, like eight of them or something. Yeah, I'm really enjoying the dark mode with orange accent color. So spooky for Halloween. It's, but, like, I didn't even think of that until after I saw a tweet about, like, oh, October, got to set the orange one. And I was like, oh, but, like, that's what I just do in my normal life anyway. Yeah. I think, yeah, my personal Mac here, I'm also running dark and orange. Mm-hmm. Um, I, it is important to note, of course, that, like, this mainly just changes the the color of the the you know the chrome and the menus uh for mainly for like system level stuff um you know if you've got like a chrome window open that's not going to change the color of of the chrome window um it's very easy to see which apps followed and used the standard mac os classes and which Mm. ones went off the rails and ran their own thing (laughs) or used electron look at it use slack yeah, come to think of it, most of the apps that I use uh, apparently do not follow whatever you just said. Interesting, because most of the apps I use do. Slack is really the only one that doesn't. I use Safari. I use um, Apple Mail, Finder, Fantastical, Tweetbot. Logic Pro 10 is already, is already a dark mode, but now it's like a medium mode because it's not as dark as the system dark mode. <laughs> but before, it was dark mode. So the pro yeah. apps have always had a little different style. I usually just have Chrome, Slack, Hangouts, which is technically another Chrome window, and like Discord open. Uh, yeah, uh, those all run the Chrome V8 engine. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> this is me and my very expensive aluminum MacBook or Chromebook. Shoot, I messed up that joke. Uh, I'm trying to combine Chrome and Mac into one, but I can't figure out a good way. Yeah, no. But anyway, um, with the dark theme, they also have dynamic wallpapers, so they'll change throughout the day with the the time of day at your location. 
Mm-hmm. So, you know, when it gets dark out, it starts to switch to a nighttime view on their kind of sand dune that they have. Um, I mostly use my work computer during the day, so it always looks the same there. And I mostly use my personal computer at night, so it always looks the same there. <laughs> um, I had dark mode on on my work computer, but I turned it off because it just was, I don't know. It was fine, but I felt like I was just using it to use it, and I don't really need to use it at work. It's I'm there in the day. Keep it light. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Um, and also related to dark mode, um, Safari just got a, an update in their technical preview branch. So it's kind of like the beta. So it, it's not, uh, Chrome and Firefox have beta branches. It's not the nightly stuff. That would be the, if you just ran WebKit, but, um, they put on an update every couple weeks. Anyway, there's a new CSS media query in there that will match if you have system dark mode. Oh. Um, so you can use, um, you know, in your CSS sheet, at media, and then parentheses, prefers color scheme, colon, light or dark. Um, and then it will match on that, or it won't. And so you can apply extra styling, like background color and text color, if you want to. So this is, yeah, so this is a tool that website developers can take advantage of if they want to, you know, personalize somebody's experience on their website based on their system level preferences, yes? Yep. Um, cool. And you can also do things in um, like a meta tag in the top of your um, window um, for, or no, there's a, no, sorry, that's a related standard for supported color schemes that's still kind of being worked on a little bit. Um, but because it's a CSS media query for prefers color scheme, you can access it in JavaScript too using the window.matchmedia uh, function. Um, yeah, that should be pretty cool. I'm going to work on adding that to my site at some point. Um, Mm -hmm. I have a dark theme on my landing page, but the rest of the site is not. And it's going to be a little tricky with uh, text style and sizes and things. Yeah. Um, Maybe I'll end up recompiling the CSS framework I use with different variables, but we'll see. (laughs) Sounds like a lot of work. Yeah. Maybe I should just, you know, once I remake my website into something useful, I should just force everybody to have dark, dark theme with uh, orange accents. Be be dynamic. (laughs) Your site is so simple. It'd be easy. Yeah, well, no, but in the future, it won't be so simple. All right, so next thing that they introduced is this concept of stacks on the desktop. So if you if you activate this, which you know, which is it's kind of an opt in thing, you have to right click on the desktop and then tell it to use the stacks. Um, The operating system will automatically group like related things together so that they take up less space on the desktop, and it's it's you know essentially they're folders um but like the file system isn't going to treat them as folders yeah it's just the presentation layer yeah yeah um and when i did it basically all it did was it took like all the screenshots because screenshots by default just get saved to the desktop um it took all those and just kind of stacked them on top of each other and uh all all of my other stuff was you know already nicely organized yeah i have uh forgotten that this feature existed i've never used it and i don't think i will i keep my desktop absolutely clean my mm-hmm. working directory is my downloads folder <laughs> yeah same um which i i was excited to see in the new screenshots tool which we'll get to in a minute uh that they let you choose where the screenshots go to and i was like oh yes put those in my downloads oh, really? please i've i've liked using that tool just like you know i have it has a preview i just hit con- command c and i could paste that file anywhere Mm. Then it mm-hmm. doesn't even hit the operating system. Well, it probably hits the disk, but not much. Right. <laughs> it's hidden for me. Um. But yeah, I mean, I've I have seen so many people's desktops where they just like, ha- you know, engage in zero curation of their own desktop, and it's like, okay, this this is definitely going to be useful for you. Totally. Yeah. I'm. You know, they probably have some algorithms in there for determining which types of files are related. So it's not just, these are images, these are documents, these mm-hmm. are everything else we can classify. Quick look, which is, is that, is that like preview? Is that? That's when you is? hit spacebar when you have a, a, a file selected. Okay. It gives you a quick look. It was new in Mac OS mm-hmm. Leopard. Um, I use this all the time. So this is like how I view any file without mm-hmm. actually opening it. Okay. Because yeah. the quick look daemon reads and presents it to you. 
Yeah. Um, but yeah. yeah, the quick look supports making some edits to common file formats. Um, I should have examples here, but I so don't. like an- annotating images, um, cropping images, signing PDFs, um, stuff like that. Yeah. I just opened a YAML file. Definitely doesn't have any sort of idea what it can do with that. Same with a Python file. Yeah, no, I wouldn't expect any like text or files text. to actually be... Because, you know, like the basic editing, in quotes, of a text file is editing the text file, you know? Yeah. It's <laughs> it's not very developer-oriented. Jeez, N- Apple. No. It, what? <laughs> But yeah, that should be useful. Oh wait, here's a PDF. Can I do something with that? That seems like a common format, right? Yes. yes oh yeah, you I can should do markup. Be able to, yeah, you should be able to annotate that. Yep. Okay. Cool. Maybe I'll use it someday. And and since that's, I think it's the same tool that's built into the new screenshot tool. Um, you know, kind if you're of ever related there. Yeah. Or, yeah. 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 That tool's. Yeah. Let's just talk about that. So. Sure. Uh, New screenshots, when you take a screenshot, instead of just showing up on the desktop, it will appear in the bottom right corner of your screen a little bit. And you can do things like mark it up, share it using the share extension, do some quick look stuff, or just, Mm -hmm. as I was saying before, just copy it or something like that. Um, So it's it's more robust, like the new one on iOS 11. Okay. Have you been doing Command Shift 3 to take screenshots still? I pretty much exclusively use Command Shift Four, and then hit Spacebar, and it'll select a certain window or element in the operating system, and then apply whatever drop shadow and stuff for you. It's okay. Sick. Okay. Have you used that before? I have not. No, I was not oh. aware before. Now I wasn't aware that there was anything other than Control Shift Three, because Command Shift Four lets you. It gives you like a little crosshair and shows you the uh, dim- the, the the current index you're on. So it shows the X and the Y for the pixels on the screen, mm-hmm. and you just click and drag. And then it takes it, and then you you know it shows up on the bottom, and you could do your standard things like mark it up and whatever. So this right. is pretty. It looks like they basically just inlined the preview markup framework and put it in a like a floating alert modal. I don't know what that that view is called, but then yeah, you can delete it or share it or copy it or whatever. And they were also highlighting. Command Shift Five is that new or is has that existed already? Yeah, that is new. I didn't actually know about that until yeah. you put it in the show notes here. It's pretty slick. So when you hit Command Shift Five, it like kind of gives you a little overlay with a few different tools that you can choose from. So you can either um, take a screenshot of the entire screen, capture the current window that you're in, capture a selected section, and it gives you like a little dotted box that you can move around and resize to you know choose which section of the screen you want to screenshot. Um, it can also record your entire screen or record the selected section, um, which is freaking awesome. Uh, I have seen many, many, you know, teachers who are trying to make some sort of like training video or whatever, you know, on how to use this thing in Schoology. And, um, you know, they all have to use like third party. I hate to break it to you. QuickTime Player has supported that for many, many years. Okay. So they're just embedding that feature into this new tool. Um, and it makes sense to go in the screenshot tool absolutely yeah um so the capture selected window is the same feature as if you had done shift command four and then hit spacebar it would have grabbed certain areas of the window or of the screen but the capture Mm -hmm. selected portion is is new you with command shift four you can grab and select but you can't like find a box and then move it before capturing it Mm. you had to you had to get your first coordinate correct every time which is a little (laughs) difficult yeah. So this um, is some nice improvement. And then it also gives you a little a little drop down menu that lets you like choose where the screenshot gets saved to. Um and so I've changed that to save all my screenshots to my downloads folder cuz that's my just like kind of temporary dump stuff here. Yeah. Oh, and you can automatically save it to clipboard. That's awesome. Yeah. Yeah. And you can do timers and yeah, toggle mouse pointer. Cool. Yeah. Great new feature. Pretty, you know, niche, but welcome, you know? Um, kind of related to this quick look stuff is Finder has a few improvements. Um, there's a new gallery view. So this kind of replaces CoverFlow. I don't remember if CoverFlow was even around before. I've never used it. It always looked gimmicky to me. Even on the 2007 iPods, we're 
was a little cooler, <laughs> but it never really belonged on the Mac. Oh, was that the one where like the album arts would kind of like rotate and slide in? Yep. Yep. At the- so they'd be <laughs> facing you from the left, and then the center one would be facing you directly, and then on the mm-hmm. right they'd be facing mm-hmm. you from that direction. And um, and we're living in this like dark, like black glass world where everything is slightly yep. reflected yep. underneath. Yeah. Exactly. So gallery view is now, you know, there's a a list on the bottom that you can, you know, use your arrow keys to go through, and then they show complete metadata on the right. So this is more like a the Git info screen, but embedded right in mm-hmm. the Finder window. So that's that's pretty useful. Yeah, this is pretty huge for like like browsing through a big collection of photos. That's yeah. basically what I can imagine using this for. Yeah, photos or um, any yeah any other document really. Um, and then they have quick actions in there as well, which is kind of like the the quick look stuff that they added. So you can do like on images, you can rotate or do markup. Um, you can also have um, quick look extensions that app app store applications and other applications can support. So like I have a create PDF action, which I have, that's probably a preview one. Um, it's on an image, but you can go to, you can customize that and it'll pull up system preferences and it'll show you which quick actions you can use. Um, nice. so those are extensions that third party developers can ship as well. Uh, we got some new stuff in continuity, um, which is a feature that I have never ever used because I don't have any iOS devices. Um, but this new one is a continuity camera where you can take pictures on your phone. And if you're near your, your Mac, then those can immediately show up on the Mac for whatever you're doing. Yeah, that I don't have about a gr- right. I don't have a great grasp of how this like how this I've shows never up. Used it. I I don't find myself well, I do find myself needing photos on my Mac sometimes, but I usually just use AirDrop. Mm-hmm. Um you know, it's usually something to upload to a website and that's probably not supported by continuity. Um so their example was you're working on a keynote presentation and you have this photo on your phone and you want to insert it into a slide. So you can just go take it and then it just shows up. I don't know how you have to configure it or anything. Like you probably have to select the image area. And then if you take mm-hmm. it on your phone, when you're close enough to it, it'll just, you know, yeah, bounce like, over. But like, does it, it doesn't present like the viewfinder on your Mac screen or anything like that. No. I think. Oh, I bet there'd be too much latency for that. But co- continuity yeah. is when they added that is more of the, the mindset that you continue from one device to the other. Right. Right. So continuity camera is kind of, you're bouncing from one to the other, but it's not like it's trying to merge them together. Mm-hmm. I mean, I've I've seen people using their like Apple Watch display as the viewfinder for for the camera. So I I would imagine that you would be that they would be able to put that on the Mac screen without. They told yeah, they totally could. Latency. I think there's less of a use case though. The Apple Watch yeah. is a good example of oh yeah a remote device that is always tethered to your phone already. So yeah. We've got a few apps that used to be only on iOS that are coming to macOS now. Um, Project Marzipan, which is the silliest name that I've ever heard. Uh, <laughs> like, whenever it, you say that, I, I I feel like it's a children's toy or something. It's just the uh, Danish almond pastry stuff. Okay. Delicious. Love Marzipan. Yeah. Um, no, so... This is a multi-year effort by Apple. Uh, They -hmm. said that by next year, developers will be able to use this. Um, So this is bridging iOS to macOS. So you can run iOS applications natively on macOS. Nice. Um, And it kind of does it through a or an embedded system on your computer. So if you check out the system directory on your boot volume, and there's a new iOS support directory, which basically contains all of the needed um, frameworks and and files that build up UIKit on iOS and so you basically are running a a secondary uh it's not I don't know the the lower level frameworks well enough to describe it but um you're basically having a virtual or a a iOS device on your computer so it's it's emulating kind of well it's no it's running natively but it's it's using the um structure from ios versus porting everything into the mac os way Mm -hmm. yeah so ios came from mac os but they've changed a few things and ui kit is exclusive to ios and app kit is exclusive to 
Mac OS. <laughs> so to kind of bridge them over, they kind of need to separate them a little bit. Right. Um, now, every application runs, I think, as a forked process or a child process of some, like, marzipan demon. So if, that th- if like, one of, your, one of the app crashes or something, they're all going to go down. Mm. Or if you, you kill some support demon, it will. So things, it's it's still very much kind of based on, they're not completely isolated. I think there's still a lot more they need to figure out. So, for example, um, their new apps, one of them is the Home app. So if you are opening that and you want to set some automation, like um, I have, I turn on my lights in my room at 6 or a.m. on weekdays. But when I open up the sheet to change that, it looks very much like a iOS kind of iPad like modal. And mm-hmm. then when I want to choose the time, it is I have to click and no, I can't drag. I have to click on the time picker from iOS. So that's where you have the 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 rolling time pickers. So it's the um like you know, you would flick through it to select a time or a date. Mm-hmm. It's that exact thing. So um Apple still has to port over a lot of these core, um, you know, classes from iOS to macOS. So they've done some things. So if you have a um, a tab controller on the bottom of your iOS device, it's now up in the top in the like the the window header on the screen. Okay. So like in the Home app, it says Home Rooms Automation. Where on iOS, that would be more on the bottom of the device. Right. Right. Because you, yeah, they they put it on the bottom in iOS because that's where your thumb is when you're holding the device. But it, uh, it's more conventional on the desktop to have those menus along the top. Yeah. Yep. And um, there are a few things in the in the menu, men, bleh, in the menu bar, but it's not extremely built out. Just the the it just looks a little funky. I think it's not quite as. You know, that's probably because I'm not on a rented device. I was saying it doesn't look as sharp, but that's because. Yeah, third-party screens. <laughs> um, so they've got a couple of other first-party apps that they brought to macOS uh, in Mojave. We've got Apple News now, um, and we've got Voice Memos. Um, and I, I've played around with Voice Memos. I, I literally don't care about Apple News. Um, so <laughs> Don't forget about stocks as well. Oh, yeah, stocks. <laughs> News and stocks, yes. Um, but yeah, I played around with voice memos because I was like, oh, hey, would this be possibly, you know, kind of make it easier for prospecting podcasters to record stuff on their Macs without having to install any third party software? So I tried it out. Um, it's very, very basic. You can, you know, quickly record some audio. They give you some basic editing tools. You can trim and delete things. The replace feature is a very, very dangerous because you like select a spot in your recording and then basically it just starts overwriting from there on it doesn't like you know insert whatever you record into that spot like it doesn't well it's called replace it's called replace it's yeah like oof i don't think i would ever like use that because i would be too nervous about like accidentally going too far and overwriting more of something that i wanted you've gone in too deep yeah exactly um they let you choose whether you want to do lossless or compressed quality, so that's cool. Um, my main problem with this is that I have I they can, they don't let you access the files. Like, I have no idea where it's putting the files. Huh. It's just you know they they they've got this like little library of recordings that you've made and that it's available in the Voice Memos app. Um, presumably I think it synchronizes to the voice memos app on iOS devices, but like it, it doesn't let you access, you know, any, any, Hey Ian, have you like, tried dragging the file outside of the app A-I-F-F or anything? Um, cause that worked for me. Oh, did it? Okay. Um, cause I was like, I, I went into the file menu, right. And I was like, okay, there's gotta be like a save as, or like an export or, you know, I went into the share menu and it was like, do you want to airdrop this? And I'm like, I don't, there's nothing around here to airdrop it to, um yeah okay so just clicking and dragging it into a finder window works. yeah it's it's very much a um you know mac os way of doing it but you would you would expect an export or s- select and save yeah i don't know yeah but i i don't know what made me think of that is that ios got you know that drag and drop support mm-hmm. in ios 10 
11, 11. And so, you know, they add support for all those kind of files. So I was like, oh, I'll just try dragging it. That worked. Nice. What, no, what, format, did it, what format did it become in, in Finder? Uh, M4A. Okay. So MPEG audio. AAC. <laughs> um, I'll just note on the Apple News app, it's it's great, you know, just like however it is on, on iPad, really. Um, but I've tried resizing the window, and it just stutters when I'm trying to resize it quickly because it embeds, you know, a web view for the news article and things. And I just don't think it's optimized for macOS uh. because iOS, you, you, you can't change the screen that rapidly. You know, it shrinks from one size mm. to another, you know, and there's a little transition animation, but it's... yeah. It's not like a continuous updating the size. And so I think there's definitely some assumptions with UIKit that aren't quite valid on uh, right. macOS. Right. And so there's, you know, a few a few things here and there that they need to update as well. Speaking of web views, uh, I hear that we got some new stuff in Safari. Yeah. Um, there's improved intelligent tracking prevention. Um, so there's, you know, the Safari team is continuing to try to prevent websites from fingerprinting you. Um the iCloud keychain there will try to suggest uh, unique secure passwords and will warn you if it's a duplicate password if you're creating mm. a new one. Um, you can now use favicons on your tab bar. Yay! Or on tabs. Safari so used to have this. The... Safari so had this years and years and years ago. I don't know what, what, what happened, but I've enabled them again. Kind of nice when you have a bunch open. Good oh, to yeah. see. Oh, yeah. For sure. And it's also the case on iOS. So in Safari, yeah. on iPad and iPhone too. In, in the realm of like privacy and things like that, um, there are now a new kind of enhanced permission system for the OS. So if an application wants to use the contacts or microphone or camera or like message history or mail database or any other slew of things, mm-hmm. um, a, a permission alert will come up saying, do you want to allow this application access to this area? So it's it's kind of the same thing that's on iOS where you have your privacy section and apps can ask for your contacts or your camera or microphone. Same kind of stuff. I noticed something that I wasn't expecting. Um, so a year ago when Hi Sierra came out, right, I saw for the first time a message um, saying that like, oh, hey, you're trying to run Audacity. That's a 32-bit program. That's not going to be supported like in the future. And when I saw that, I interpreted that, that to be like, oh, in the next version of Mac OS, you know, you won't be able to use it unless... Audacity comes out with the 64-bit version, um, and in Mojave, it gave me the same the same message. So I'm still able to use Audacity, thank goodness. Uh, <laughs> but sometime in the future, uh, this this is the last release to support 32-bit applications. Okay, okay. So yeah, I've I've gotten some from Adobe. I have an old version of CS6 on my computer that um, is definitely 32-bit. Um, a few other utilities and things I've used here and there. Um, so yeah, hopefully that will be updated or developers will really push for that this year. Yeah. Yeah. And, and if they, if Audacity doesn't, man, I guess I'm not going to be using the next version of Mac OS for a while. Oh, I thought you were going to say you're not going to be using Audacity on your Mac for a while. <laughs> well, if I accidentally forget and update the Mac, uh, and I'm not able to roll it back, then yeah, I guess I won't be able to. <laughs> <laughs> able to or do if any someone accidentally editing. comes to your house and upgrades your computer for you, so you're running the latest fancy OS. Yeah, get out of here. The Mac Store looks different. Yeah, the, they the App totally. Store. They totally rewrote that. Um, it was written with some web views under the scenes, so just kind of slow, sluggish, and had some weird bugs. Um, so it's rewritten. It's nice and cocoa-y and native and fast and zippy. And yeah, it looks nice. It's kind of the same realm as the redesign of the App Store in iOS 10, 11, when they do, you know, the articles and more like a card layout. Mm -hmm. Um, And then kind of on the same realm, the system software update is now in system preferences. Oh, good. So the Mac App Store is for App Store apps. And now in system preferences, there's a... uh, an area called software update. And then that's just a little embedded... Uh, thing that was before shoehorned into the app store so the classic syst- uh, software update app is now in system preferences instead of mac app store how are they communicating that to people 
Are, like, like in a I, year, are they going to have a banner in the the app store that says, "Hey, if you want the new version of Mac OS, you got to go to your system preferences." I don't know. I haven't done that. Uh, <laughs> I don't think there have really been any software updates since I got Mojave. So, yeah, unknown. Cause, yeah, because I mean, like, I guess I'm trying to think of the Venn diagram of like people who want to keep their operating system up to date and people who aren't going to be paying attention to this kind of thing about like oh where is you know when is is apple releasing a new software update you know when where do they keep this tool in the operating system i i don't know how much of an overlap there is between those two categories of people yeah i do think Having in the App Store or having it in System Preferences are the two best best places for it. Yeah, System Preferences is more online in line with how Windows does it in the Settings app. Mm-hmm. There's the Updates section, so I think it makes sense to me. I don't uh, know. Yeah, it makes sense to me. It's just that it being a change, there is the risk of people not knowing that that thing has changed and then not ever realizing that there is a system update available to them. Yeah. Well, I think Apple will likely still give you alerts and still spam you updates, updates, (laughs) not quite like windows does, but in the Apple way, (laughs) (laughs) I mean, windows sometimes doesn't warn you. It just restarts. True. And one final thing about Mojave is coming soon. I believe in the 10.14.1 update, probably. Okay. Uh, will be group FaceTime. So this is a feature that will be coming to iOS 12 in iOS 12.1, um, along with new emoji. Mm-hmm. Um, I think they're on beta 5, so it should be coming out in the next few weeks, I would think. Um, or may, pro- maybe even next week, because there's the Apple event on Tuesday. For seems, strange that that's, and things. seems strange that that's something that needs an, an operating system update. Uh, for what? Group FaceTime? Yeah, because it's like, I mean, that should just be a feature in the app that you can update by updating the app. Well, the app is only updated when you update the OS. That's what I'm saying. Why is that? Yeah. It's weird. I don't know. I, yeah, I think it's easier to kind of isolate because there a lot of those app system applications use private frameworks and OS mm-hmm. level features. And when you have to support multiple versions of the OS, like backwards compatibility and things become difficult when you you have all of your logic in a in an OS level framework and your application is just a front end for it. Mm-hmm. If the front end needs to be updated and the framework doesn't, you know, it's you have to support many more combinations of versions. And yeah. it's just more I'm, difficult to do. I'm just thinking about the fact that like, you know, there there are many, many video calling systems that have supported having multiple people in a group call on many versions of Mac OS over the years. So it's like, you know, I feel like like FaceTime should be able to achieve that without having to have new frameworks built into the So FaceTime system. has only supported one person to one person since its start in 2010. And so yeah. it's such a pair that it's they probably had to rewrite nearly the entire stack to support multiple people because you can't just assume person A person B. You're right, but, variable but number what I'm saying is like why is the FaceTime stack built into the operating system you know it's just it seems like a something that should be split up i don't know maybe i mean you trigger facetime from contacts app from the facetime app from um i think they probably ship one framework across all platforms you could embed that in an app but Mm -hmm. they don't have the concept of contact plugins so they embed it as an os level feature Mm. Anyway, that's Mac OS Mojave. Yep. Go and um, go and update. Yeah, it's I, pretty I, good. I can't, um, I can't think of a reason not to. I've heard of a couple people who had issues installing it. I mm-hmm. had to boot into safe mode mid-installation uh, on my work computer yeah. to get it to work, and then it worked fine. Uh, my uncle updated his iMac and had to. it got stuck, and so he had to boot into recovery and reinstall Mojave on top of a partially installed Mojave system, but then it worked. <laughs> but like my sister up, upgraded her... 2013 macbook pro just fine um, yeah. i know other people who had zero issues so i didn't have any issues good so. that's so, all folks brian where can people find you on the internet you can find me on twitter at brian mitch l 
or on my website, brianm.me. I have a brand new uh, review of the iPhone XS Max. I was realizing the other day, it's almost all good things. I have a, a couple, like one or two things I'm like, hmm, about Face ID with, but I probably should have been more uh, constructive, but <laughs> yeah, I'm, I'm overviewing the features that I think are fun. I mean, we also, we, nice. we got a little constructive in the uh, second opinion review of the XS and the XS Max. So Yeah, true. You know, yep. Where could we find uh, you? I am Ian R. Buck. You can find me on Twitter as Ian R. Buck. Um, and this has been an episode of Second Opinion, which is released under a Creative Commons license. So feel free to take any part of it and do whatever you want with it, as long as you link back to the original page, which is thenexus.tv slash SO52. If you would like to discuss this review with other listeners, please go to our subreddit at... Uh, reddit.com slash r slash the nexus tv and if you would like to support us financially as we cover all sorts of tech stuff here on the nexus uh, please go to patreon.com slash the nexus tv and remember that no matter where you're listening to this you should definitely go and subscribe to second opinion reviews in your favorite podcast player so you can get all the new episodes as soon as they come out until next time have a good one Have a good one. The Nexus. The Nexus. The Nexus TV. Podcasts from from the the Technological Convergence. Convergence. Tech news is dominated by big announcements with big, bombastic personalities. Developers, 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 developers. Sometimes they make us laugh. Yes, I'd like to order 4,000 lattes to go, please. Sometimes we laugh at them. Courage. Sometimes we're filled with awe. There it is. Check that out. Wow. Yeah. Sometimes they throw shade. Toxic hell stew. Sometimes they inspire. Live, learn, and love. They never want us to forget. Remember? That the show's never over because... I got one more thing. Now, it's often difficult to make the journey to see these events live. This is a freaking dirt road! Oh my god! (laughs) But we here at the Nexus TV have got you covered. On our show, Nexus Special, we recap and analyze all the biggest announcements and keynote events in the tech world. So come join us as we explore the brave new worlds that await us. Subscribe to Nexus Special in your favorite podcast player today.